One of the most overlooked sections, in my opinion, of the way that we teach chemistry is we don't look often at solids and materials that aren't in aqueous solutions. The chemistry we teach is really great for helping students with biology because all of the aqueous solution chemistry that we teach them is readily applicable to a lot of the biological systems that they'll study. We don't often look at the materials that they encounter in everyday life, and I remember in my intro chemistry class in high school that there was this whole block of the periodic table where I recognized the name of every single element there, like copper and iron, and we never talked about these things ever as metals. I'm like, why don't we ever talk about the metals? So this demonstration is a nice way that you can integrate some of what's happening inside of molecular structure, or not molecular structure, but really what's happening in the bonding between atoms in metals. And have the real-world explanation of what's going on because students will encounter steel all the time. So a demonstration that's quick and easy. You might have seen the process of annealing bobby pins or something like that before. Instead of a bobby pin, I prefer to use just a regular, ordinary paperclip. These are the large jumbo ones, and the nice thing is I never usually have to go shopping for these because I've got a box of about 5,000 of them sitting in my room somewhere, and so I just keep using it.、Uh, But the neat thing about this is that these are designed to be springy. So if you pick off at the one side of it, it snaps back. All of your paper clips are designed to hold that bend very carefully. So I'm going to go through various processing of how we can change the nature of steel, and I'll show you a nice analogy you can use to show what's happening between the atoms here. The nature of the metallic bond is kind of interesting. In the case of covalent bonding, we often say that electrons are shared between atoms. In the case of ionic bonding, we usually say that one thing gives up electrons, another thing takes on the electrons, and the positive and negative attraction holds the ionic compound together. And then we usually never talk about metallic bonding. In the case of metallic bonding, it's kind of like having all of these electrons that nobody wants. They're sort of free to fly from one nucleus to another. Because metals don't hold on to their valence electrons with a huge amount of force, nor are they attempting or have any incentive to pull more electrons towards them. So, if anything, the electrons are free to move wherever they need to. This makes metals good conductors of heat and electricity. It's responsible for the malleability of metals, and this demonstration is a nice way you can show some of the nature of metallic bonding. So, I just fold the paper clips back, and I'm going to use a propane torch here just because it gives me a slightly better tip when I'm trying to heat the flame up. Bunsen burner works for this too, but I just find the propane torch a little bit easier. So the first thing I do for the demonstration is just light the propane torch, and then I'm going to heat this up. The first heating that I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to anneal the wire. So what you do when you anneal is you heat it up to the point that it's red hot. When the metal gets red hot, it actually changes the way that the atoms are arranged. They go from one cubic packing arrangement to a different one. So I'm just going to heat up to the point that it's red hot, and I'm just going to leave it down on the countertop to cool. So this is heating it to a high temperature, to a temperature that can convert to a different allotrope. And an allotrope is just a different arrangement of atoms in the same element. So, for example, oxygen and ozone are considered allotropes of each other. Phosphorus has several allotropes. We have just different arrangements: graphite and diamond and carbon, different molecular arrangements of the same element. So, I'm going to let this one just anneal. The next one I'm going to do is I'm going to heat it up to that red hot point, and I'm going to take the metal and quench it, put it into a beaker full of cold water. So I'm going to heat it up to that really high temperature where the allotrope is going to convert from one form to another, and then I'm going to quench it, cool it down very, very rapidly. So here we've got the red hot, and then I'll pull out my beaker here, and I've got the red hot steel. And I just cool it down, and you can sometimes hear a little tss as it gets quenched. You are boiling away some of the water, so you hear a little bit of that. And I'll hold this for the close-up, and you can see it's got sort of a little bit of an oxide coat on the outside of it. Well, when you heat iron up to high temperatures, oxygen is inevitably going to react a little bit. So I'll set that one out. So we have annealed and we have tempered, or not tempered. Sorry, we have annealed and we have hardened steel here. Well, I'm going to do one more. I'm going to heat it up and quench it. But then I'm going to heat it up gently the second time. So again, we'll heat this to the point that it's red hot, quench it in the cold water, and then I'm just going to gently on the outside of the flame, not in the hottest part of the flame, but just sort of gently heat it back up again. 
All I want to do here is just warm the atoms around a little bit and give them a little bit of time to sort of rearrange in the new crystalline structure. And we'll see if we can see some slightly different patterns forming here. So the gentle heating this time is when we're tempering. And if you want to get a close up of that. So let's compare the properties of these. I've got one as a control just so I can see how these things compare to each other. And so I have just a regular spring and if I try to pull this apart, it just snaps back. So it's very springy. If I take my annealed wire and I try to bend it, it bends with minimal effort whatsoever. It's very, very soft in this arrangement. If I go for my hardened steel, if I bend it, the interesting thing is the part that I hardened doesn't bend anymore. In fact, the rest of the paper clip is the part that gets sacrificed. This part is really stuck in that position. And then if I go to the tempered steel, I go back to something that's slightly flexible, and I'm going to actually temper one more because this isn't doing quite what I want, but you go back to that springy nature. When they manufacture the paper clips, they manufacture them in a tempered state, so they still have that spring. They'll hold their form. Now, why would you want to do any of this? Well, hardening steel, when you take it and you quench it right away, if you want a really tough, durable steel, like in cutting surfaces or knives, most of your knives that are good quality cutting knives are temp are in fact heated up and then shocked in a cold state that freezes them in a locked position and makes them very, very durable. Now this is hard for my students to visualize if I'm just talking about it. So a really handy tool that you can build to use in your classroom is just this. This is just two sheets of plexiglass with a little plexiglass border around it held together with a glue that will hold plexiglass and it's just filled with some BBs, regular shot that you can buy in a store. But the interesting thing about this is that if we look at this from the overhead, and I put this in my classroom on the overhead projector and they can watch the shadows on the wall, is that what's happening on the molecular level? Well, really these things are just vibrating around. They're moving around and around. So if I heat things up, we have lots of kinetic energy, right? So we can move these around. They can rearrange in whatever state they want to. But if I cool them down really, really slowly, and very gently, what do you notice about the arrangement of those spheres? We have a very highly ordered arrangement. So this metal becomes very soft and we have this nice, perfect crystalline arrangement. Now, what happens when we quench it? Well, we're going to heat that back up till the, the crystals are starting to rearrange and we'll have the crystalline arrangement and then shock it cold. Well, now do we have that nice ordered crystalline arrangement anymore? We don't. We have all these sort of fault lines and we have places where there's gaps and emissions. These things can't slide past each other very easily. I'll go back to the annealed state so you can see what these things look like in comparison to each other. In the case of the annealed state, we have a really slow formation of the crystals. Well, if you look, we have a nice slip line here. These things can slide anywhere that there are atoms perfectly arranged in a row. Well, things that slide past each other, isn't that kind of what malleability is? The ability of atoms to sort of slide past each other in the solid state. That's why the wire is very easy to bend, because we have all of these directions that atoms can slide past each other. But if we go back to the overhead and we look at what happens when we shock the steel cold, we get all these domains of lines and hard spots. Well, these things aren't as flexible and as mobile as the other ones are. So when we harden steel, shock it down, then we get to the point where these things can't slide past each other very well. You don't want your kitchen knife blade to be able to bend in half. That would not be the purpose of having a good knife. So we harden steel by quenching it and changing the atomic arrangement on the molecular level. And then when we temper things, we take it from the shock position and we add just a little bit more energy. So you start to make bigger domains of where you have this. So it gives a little bit of give, just a little bit, but it's going to snap back to the position you really want it to be in. 
So it's a really nice, elegant demonstration. The BB board especially you can bring out at other times of the year when you want to show differences between states and matter, what happens from a solid, a hexagonal, closed, packed arrangement, and just a little bit of energy causes it to go to the liquid phase, and then you can add more energy and get it going into the gas phase. It really helps your students visualize what's happening because really when I see chemistry, I just see a bunch of spheres around colliding in space, making up all of the observations that we see. Thank you.